Well, welcome back to the Back Porch Education Podcast. Today, we're going to tell a story about math. Here with me today is uh, my boss, <laughs> the fellow that I teach for uh, at a local high school, and uh, a friend as well, and a fellow educator, Craig Conticchio, who I'm going to let introduce himself here in a few minutes. But as we normally do with the Back Porch Education Podcast, have a little, uh, not a poem, Jason might be disappointed in me, but, but a quote from uh, a fellow on his way towards sainthood. In the Catholic Church, G.K. Chesterton, he, he tried hard to have a foot in the humanities and in the sciences, and uh, in doing so came up with this quote that I, I want you to think about as, as Craig and I get started with our episode today. He said, the difference between the poet and the mathematician is that the poet tries to get his head into the heavens, while the mathematician tries to get the heavens into his head. And I think both of those enterprises are worth our time and effort. Uh, Today, we're focusing on mathematics, not a subject you would normally hear me trying to do a podcast on. Uh, But I've, like I said, got a friend and fellow colleague who who knows quite a bit about mathematics and and is a lover of mathematics. Craig, welcome to Back Porch Education Podcast. Uh, Tell the folks just a little bit about yourself uh, before I get you to tell us a story. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, so I, you know, I, just like every other red-blooded American boy, you know, I went to college a little bit later, or finished college, or went back to college a little bit later in life. Uh, I studied theoretical physics, biomedical uh, theoretical physics, and um, somehow got roped into you know volunteering and teaching a physics class for for the school I'm currently the principal of you know, just trying to help out. I had a spot in my schedule and they needed, they had a need for a physics teacher immediately. And so I helped out and, and somehow or another, the next thing I know, I'm, I'm running the place and, um, and <laughs> loving it. So uh, here I am. Well, good. Um, as colleagues, you and I on a regular basis discuss education, uh, you in particular discussing with me, my performance as an educator, uh, but but I've heard you tell a story several times, which is why I invited you on. You walked into uh, a class in college and had a rather shocking statement made to you, and then the the professor backed it up, re- referring, I believe, to your to your college calculus class. Could you uh, tell us that story uh, so we have the basis for for a discussion thereof? Sure. So you know. Um, in my high school career, I wasn't the best student, uh, and and to your dismay, I wasn't a really, uh, 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 I wasn't a very good uh, humanities student. But I was a really good math student. It just came easy to me. It, um, you know, I just saw solutions. I just saw a path to a solution quite easily, and that followed me into college. and And I ended up, you know, uh, learning with a bunch of physicists and engineer types. And so uh, we walk into a you know college class designed for physicists and engineers or future physicists and engineers, and the the math professor looks at us, and I remember he looked me right in the eye and he said, um, "Y'all are ignorant." And I just kind of did a double take, uh, and 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 clearly we were all offended because we we're pretty bright guys, we thought anyway, uh, and gals, excuse me, um, and and. And we just kind of looked at him and, and one, one kid, you know, piped up and said, well, what does that mean? He said, when it comes to math, y'all are ignorant. You don't know anything. And of course, you know, many of us were like, well, we kind of beg to differ. You know, we, we got this far and we're, you know, made straight A's and uh, in our math classes up to this point and scored very well on our SATs coming into this place on math. And that's why we're here. And he said, no, 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 no. I didn't say you were dumb. Didn't say you didn't know how to do math. He said, "I," he, he said, "I said you're ignorant when it comes to math." And he clarified that. He said, "Sure, many of you can can sort of do 
the nuts and the bolts and, and you can see solutions pretty clearly. He said, but you don't know why. You know the how, that's fine. You could turn a wrench and, you know, unloosen a bolt. But if you don't know how the bolt is made or why the bolt works the way it works, what real good is it uh, to you? Mm. So, you know, he, he proceeded to prove to us that we were indeed ignorant when it came to mathematics. Uh, he started a, a college level calculus class with the definition of zero. And he built everything that we had ever learned about math on that definition. And by the time we were through, we weren't ignorant anymore. We understood why we did what we already did well, mind you, but we understood a lot better about why we did what we did and how we did it and understood better why mathematics works the way it does. And really, for for somebody working in theoretical physics like I was, it was extremely important, uh, and it, it 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 really helped me to to do the research that I did and manipulate the mathematics in such a way because I did have this deep understanding now of why it worked the way it worked. So, as an educator, yeah. how do you take that? And apply it forward. How do, how do you use that? You've taught physics. You've taught math math classes. Do you walk in and tell the kids they're ignorant, or uh, uh, how, how do you use that story as an educator? Well, I do my best not to walk in and call them ignorant because the phone calls that would follow <laughs> would. Uh, would yeah, be. I was going to say if if that's open methodology, I might adopt it. But then no, no, no. We if shouldn't your do phone. That. <laughs> okay. No, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but I do, I do, um, when I teach mathematics or physics, or, and, and I like to expect from my teachers to, uh, I'll tell them that story because I think it's important that um, kids understand w- why it is they're doing what they're doing and how it works underneath. The mechanics of mathematics is really, when it comes down to it, is kind of the easy part. You just follow a procedure. And, you know, you follow step by step by step by step. And, and if, as long as you follow those steps in sort of a monkey see, monkey do way, you can do math and you can score well on math. I'm proof of that. Right. But if they really, really understand why it works the way it works, they can take the skills acquired to solve problems, not only in math or physics, but in life. Right. If you can understand how the underlying issues and what is the problem that I'm trying to solve Why am I trying to solve it? Now, what are the tools and how do those tools work? How do I, how do I come about a good solution to this problem? Those are the skills I think are important uh, to teach these kids. Yeah, I think, I think Socrates taught us that the first questions in a classroom are those that reveal our ignorance or those that reveal our need to learn. And that I think too many kids, especially I, I, I'd love to hear you t- give your opinion on this notion that there are math people and non-math people. Uh, you even, uh, in your story, alluded to the fact that math came easily to you. I think that there's a predisposition in most people either toward number or toward word. But anyone can, as you said, learn the, the steps, the process, uh, follow the leader, so to speak. And, and, and unfortunately, I think many math classes turn into that. Here, I'm going to do a few of these up on the board you pay close attention. I might even have you do a few in front of me. Now go home and do 20 more. And assuming you get the right answer to all of those, I'm ready to move you on to the next step. As you said, without them understanding why the steps work the way they do or where they might lead or where they come from, there's, there seems to be a lack of connection, uh, so much so that when talking about science or math, you, you've referenced the narrative of that subject. Can you, you shed a little light on, on, on the story behind a, a mathematics subject or a, or a science subject like, like physics? Yeah, sure. You, again, everybody's a little bit different, but, but sort of going backwards a little bit, you know, the, uh, the idea that, um, again, the sort of monkey see, monkey do thing, it's easy, right? It's easy to teach that way. And it's, you know, a larger institution setting where there's 30 or 40 kids in your classroom, there's really no way to, in my opinion, to teach mathematics properly where you can actually take the time and explain 
you know, why things work the way they are and, and create this narrative story from start to finish, you know, here, like, like my old cranky professor did, you know, here's the story, here's the story of zero and here's how you add a one to it. And here's how you add a two to it. You know, this, this sort of narrative that you carry with you forever. Right. I mean, uh, it, if you learn how to factor a quadratic uh, equation mechanically, you are likely going to forget that by the time a uh, you know, kid comes from algebra two to pre-calculus, let's say over a summer, they're probably gonna forget how they were supposed to factor those things. But if they remember why they were doing it, what the tools were that they were doing it with, um, they're much more likely to remember how, how to uh, do the mechanics of the thing. So yeah, some of our teachers and and like to build a, a narrative, a story from start to finish. Uh, uh, you know, whether it be physics, whether it be mathematics, and and look, uh, you know, in the humanities, we 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 teach stories, we tell stories, right? And I think um, that is a, a very important way. And I guess we're talking about retention here, right? So it's a very important way to remember uh, the stuff that that we want our kids to learn and not just, you know, lose it. Yeah. It becomes a skeleton that we hang all the, that's uh, most people, uh, especially with science, math, there's only quote unquote, so many numbers, unless you really believe in infinity. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, with science, uh, often the student is saying, man, there's just so much information. And I think that it's a big blob of stuff they're trying to memorize until you give them a structure. And I, and I think the notion of a story or a, an outline or a, a series of, of hooks to hang this information on, then it starts to, there starts to be connections between it rather than just I got to remember all this stuff until I take the test. And then, like you said, I can, I can forget it. Thank God. And, and back behind it is the, the, if, if you'll allow me the phrase meta narrative of problem solving, right? A, a lot of, I have students ask me all the time. I don't know why we have to take math. When are we going to ever use this stuff? And of course they're asking who they, they think is a, is a ally, a Ooh. humanities teacher. <laughs> and I say, well, you're absolutely right. As soon as there's no problems in life, there's really no reason for you to practice and learn how to solve problems. Oh, I don't think that's the, you know, they'll, they'll start to try and, and backpedal, but you can see their little minds going, oh, I just got caught in a trap there. <laughs> and, and, and I think part of that's just the mistake of, of modern educators to put such heavy emphasis on performance and GPA and standardized testing, whatnot, that, they, that they lose sight of the fact that students are allowed to lose sight of the fact we're forming a whole person here, and and the mathematical side. I, I love the Chesterton quote because he's absolutely right. We're trying to we're trying to get the whole world understandable, uh, organized, ordered, understanding our place in it, understanding that there is a purpose to it, and ultimately, even with the pursuit of number, it's the pursuit of God, and the and the order and structure and meaning that He has put in everything, not just in highfalutin philosophy or theology. But but in something as basic, and I and I mean this as a compliment, um, as physics, right? That mm-hmm. that the fundamental underlying principles of the whole way things work are there because there's a God that made them to work, and they are sensible, not absurd. They're not. They're not. I, I really bulk against the modern use of the word random. I'm still not convinced that that word has any meaning, but. <laughs> Uh, well, we can have a scientific uh, discussion about that at some point if you like, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the notion of perceive, not being able to perceive the order behind it, uh, uh, but at least in, in the science lab, my my primary assumption is that it's not random, that there's causation and that there's probability and that sort of thing. Well, look, even even in randomness, Steve, uh, you know, if you if you follow uh, Stephen Wolfram, uh, he has done extensive work to show how there is order in randomness. Right. Uh, and what we call randomness or probably a better word is chaos. Right. Uh, thermodynamics and chaos and all these kinds of things. But he's he and his teams have, have done extensive work uh, showing uh, sort of the order in chaos, the, these uh, uh, fractals. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I often tell my kids when I teach, uh, and sort of going back to your quote in the beginning, and, and I quote uh, Einstein, and I say, you know, uh, he said, you know, you, 
are not going to find God with math and science. Uh, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here. He said, but you will get some idea of what he had in mind. And that's and that's the real story, right? That's the real story that we're trying to discover. In, in getting closer to God, we can, if we understand the the universe that he created, we're getting closer to God. We we won't meet him that way. I think a lot of scientists and mathematicians and, and that kind of minded people like to think that they're going to find meaning in the universe through math and science. And I don't believe that. I don't think Einstein believed that. I think um, what I believe and and is is that you can you can get an idea for the blueprint. You can look and see the design and how beautiful it is and how it all connects together in, in such a way. Um, you know, uh, in mathematics and geometry and and, and the way nature works and uh, different patterns that you see and the mathematics behind them. It's a beautiful thing. And, and that's what we like to try and pass on to our kids, not necessarily the mechanics of the thing, because they may or may not use that, right? They may not have to ever integrate uh, a function again in their life if they don't go into, you know, uh, engineering or physics or something like that. But they can get a glimpse at the blueprints uh, that the world is made of. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Well, it's I, I, on, on a humorous note uh, here in the midst, as we are, as we record this of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of parents are, uh, you know, putting out there on social media, the fact that they never thought I would have to use my math instruction again <laughs> until I had to, <laughs> had to teach it to my kid. The, the, the meme out there about uh, stop putting these, math puzzles out. If you need help with your child's math homework, just ask for it. Don't make it into a puzzle. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we, we do, I, I think when it's best learned, uh, mathematics enters into us and removes from us the conscious calling up of and remembering of things. Like you said, if you're in a, if you're, you, well, even if you're in a career that involves mathematics, at some point you're living in that math rather than standing outside it, trying to trying to see in. And I, I think that that's the gift that a good mathematician in the math class, a good scientist in the science, a, 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 a good physics teacher isn't trying to turn everybody into physicists. He's trying to uh, awaken minds to the beauty of this subject and how it's connected to the rest of the subjects. And I think that's one of the great gifts a good school should, a student as they walk away from that school should have a real strong sense of the beauty of all the subjects that they studied. I think it's a, a I think it's a failure if a student walks away with a distaste for the subject. Um, yeah, I mean, they may know their limitations and that a C was a really good grade for me in calculus or whatever, but I appreciate it better having sat under that teacher who loved it and expressed it in a meaningful way, as opposed to just, here's what you got to do to get an A. So I, I appreciate the story and the fact that there is, <laughs> it's, it's heartening to a humanities guy, especially an old dog like me, that, that I could still hope to see the story um, of mathematics or of, of, of science subjects. Craig, I appreciate your time and effort and uh, appreciate your own apprehension of the beauty of the things that you teach and the effect that has on on students when they when they perceive it. Uh, until next time, I appreciate everybody joining us on the Back Porch Education. As always, make use of our comments section. If you've got specific questions that this podcast has brought up to your mind, please pop them on there. You know that we're quick to respond. Uh, most of the time, it's your questions that make the next podcast. So uh, until next time, thank you. Thank you, Craig, for being with us. See you next time. You can't have your meat if you don't eat your vegetables.